So, a few months ago, I was out in Alviso in the Slows, and I was sitting on this embankment out in the bay and just looking out over the, over the bay and all the wildlife and the egrets sitting there and the birds flitting about. And then I thought, wow, this is a really beautiful natural scene, and you can just see the ecosystem all around us. But then on the horizon, it wasn't the bay itself just extending on forever. It, it was the buildings of Silicon Valley, you know, steel, glass, just dominating the edge. And then I thought, wow, that, that's a stark contrast if there ever were one, right? But then as I just sat there by myself as the minutes went on in that afternoon, I was thinking, well, Maybe the same systems that I see around me right now in, in this ecosystem, this wetland ecosystem, can really, we, we can really see them in human artificial systems as well. It, they work the same way. They're not so different after all. And so I'm going to be talking about complexity today and how complexity manifests itself both in the natural world and in the artificial human world and how those two things aren't that different. So first, we should talk about what complexity really is. Um, and of course, we should, we should look at the word itself, right? And, and it comes from Latin and it comes from yeah, cum and plexus. So it means woven together. And sometimes we think of complexity as just m meaning that something has many different parts. But that's not the crux of, of, of the word. It, it really means the idea that everything in, this, in, in a complex situation, in a complex problem, all of those parts are extremely interwoven together and they're inextricable. And if you move one part, it moves everything everything else in that system. And that's really important to think about because some of the things that we simplify around this are actually quite complex. So going back to the afternoon, ecology is one of those, one of those fields. So let's talk about uh, uh, you know, the evolution of this complexity right, in ecosystems described by ecology. right. On the right here, we have this idea of an active trend. There are two competing um, ideas of how evolution has uh, evolved in the natural world. And uh, first, there was the idea of this active trend, that organisms would evolve to fulfill like a perfect state, um, that they would have a, grow a limb, an appendage, and that would be fulfilling some sort of destined state. And so if we look at the distributions here, this is time and this is complexity, at the beginning you have a whole lot of very... Um, uh, uncomplex organisms, and then as time goes on, that whole plot just shifts to the right and everything gets more complex. The thing is, this has not really been in favor in the scientific fields as of late. Even in 1953, the biologist uh, George Gaylord Simpson called active, um, this active trend something that could only be described as a mysterious inner force, because there was no real biological explanation for why things would just evolve for some teleological purpose. Now, instead, we have this idea of a, a passive trend, where, again, we have a whole lot of organisms at first at the uh, uncomplex side, and then as time goes on, it's not that the plot moves to the right, it just gets bigger. We have more and more types of organisms that differentiate um, but the idea is that the trend itself stays weighted towards the uncomplex side. So what you really have is a whole lot of a proliferation of really uncomplex organisms. Think of prokaryotes like bacteria or something like archaea that really don't have much biological complexity, but then these ecosystems are dominated by the most complex individuals, individual organisms, which actually comprise the minority of those ecosystems. So let's look at a food chain, a food web, right? These are actually quite complex uh, situations, right? Uh, if we're thinking about biological complexity, at the bottom we have these primary producers. These are things at the basis, like bacteria, and uh, then as you go more complex, you go up the food chain or the food web, right? But it isn't purely hierarchical. You can't just define one, two, three, four levels or something like that. You have things that seem to nest in between levels or um, things that occupy multiple levels, different organisms. And yet we still have a way to rationalize this complexity and chaos to a degree by saying, oh, okay, we have primary producers. These herbivores eat those primary producers. Those primary consumers eat those herbivores and so on. 
So we have ways to do this. We, they're models to describe something that isn't purely describable by models. Same thing with something like proteins, right? We have, at the very basis, we, ha we have DNA, right? And we understand the sequence of that DNA, and we can determine that biochemically. And then we have larger structures about how that DNA, those strands of DNA fold together. Um, but we don't really have a full understanding of exactly how this works. We have these uh, amino acids brought together in beta sheets and alpha helixes, but we don't actually know how those fold. In fact, there's a citizen science game out there right now called Fold It, where users actually have to determine how these sheets will fold because we don't fully understand biochemically why these things fold. And yet, like the food web in ecology, we still define primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure, things that aren't necessarily intrinsically defined but are our own labels for something that's quite complex. Um, so then, let's talk about a larger ecosystem. That, that, that's the whole world. This is a glacier, right? And this is not a glacier in good condition. So s historians and scientists used to think that the massive glacier melts in the 19th century were caused by the end of the Little Ice Age. And this was just an increasing global temperature that caused the uh, glaciers to melt. And this was the, you know, the opinion for, for many years, for decades. Um, but the thing is, the scientists and historians weren't really considering the system of the whole Earth because they were considering just the glacier itself. What we've dis discovered in recent years is that instead of just a glo like this climactic phenomenon, this coincides, this melt-off of glaciers coincides with the widespread proliferation of soot from the Industrial Revo uh, Re Revolution. And so, as factories proliferated across Western Europe, they would produce soot, and then the soot would get carried to the Arctic regions and glaciers um, around the world, and that soot would be deposited, and since it's black, it would reduce the albedo effect on the glaciers, and the glaciers would melt fast, uh, faster, they would absorb that sunlight because of their darker pigment like we see right here. And this is happening in the modern day, too. We can't just describe how glaciers melt by the glacier itself. We have to understand the factors surrounding it, like soot from factories, or perhaps the uh, friction caused when glaciers are melting. When the glaciers melt, they move faster. That causes even more friction, causing them to melt even faster. So we can't just say this block of ice is uh, you know, a physical substance and we're going to model the rate of uh, melt of that ice based off of the ice itself. We have to consider everything around it. Take another uh, ecosystem, uh, the Great Lakes. So in 1986, uh, two different species of mussels were introduced to the Great Lakes, the zebra mussel and the quagga mussel. And these uh, came from Ukraine, and they had been in the lakes of Ukraine, Japan, everywhere around the world. And they were doing fine in the Great Lakes, too. Um, and, and this was not a problem. But then as the years went on, suddenly the waters of the Great Lakes just magically clarified. You could just see everything. And they used to be had, uh, the algae was part of the ecosystem, and something was eating this algae. It turns out it was these mussels. This had never happened anywhere else, and people didn't understand why. Why is it that we see this exact species of mussel or species of mussel everywhere else, and then suddenly, inexplicably, we have a, an enormous population explosion that's destroying the ecosystem of the lakes? And the problem is, again, they were thinking, the scientists were thinking about the mussel itself, not the environment of the muscle. Turns out minor, minor changes in things like pH or water temperature can have an enormous effect on the populations of muscles themselves. And this was a climactic factor, an environmental factor that was determining the populations of the muscles themselves. Now, why do I bring this up? Well, it turns out just a few weeks ago, actually, um, the physician and writer Siddhartha Mukherjee uh, wrote an article in the New York about this exact the New Yorker about this exact phenomenon, and why? Because cancerous metastases follow a similar uh, a path. So a, a metastasis, you know, you have a primary tumor, right? And then it it blood vessels grow in that tumor, and then eventually you have cancerous cells come off of that shed from that tumor and then enter the bloodstream, and then reappear somewhere else in the human body. Now, for years, I mean decades, scientists were trying to understand 
genetically find a gene why certain cells in these cancerous regions would, occur, uh, would split off and come into metastases. And it turns out in 1886, uh, um, a a British scientist actually had the right idea. It wasn't the cancerous cells, it was the environment of the cells themselves. And no one thought about this until just a few years ago when researchers actually started studying how often cancerous bodies shed cells. And they were considering the problem of the, can the cell itself. What's about, what is it about the cell biochemically that causes it to form a metastasis? This was like the wrong idea because it turns out that if you measure the rate of um, shedding of cancers, of tumors, it, they're shedding hundreds of cells, hundreds of thousands of cells every day. This is not a problem of a cell comes off of a tumor and goes somewhere else in the body. This is all types of cells are coming off continuously. And it's the, the surprising thing is not that you get a metastasis at all. It's that you don't get metastases everywhere in the body. And, and so this was quite curious, and scientists have been looking, well, why is it that you never see metastases in the hands or feet, but you see them in the human liver? And this is all about environmental factors. Again, if you actually examine the type of cell that you see in the liver or in versus in the hand or foot, you see that the environmental cell, the human body cell, is what actually determines whether a metastasis will occur. And um, this, this is very interesting, right? This is in the medical establishment, scientific establishment, which prides itself you know, on reductionism, breaking down a problem into its component parts, parts understanding its parts. And this has been hugely successful. Right, we wouldn't even know about anything about how cancers work if we didn't have analysis and reductionism. And yet, this doesn't explain everything. And so, when we start to use these techniques of systems biology on the natural world, perhaps we should look to our world itself. So, if we go to um, uh, the medical establishment, right, that's a complex system. Our healthcare system is enormously complex, of, as we've seen from recent years, right? Um, and the idea is that we have immense specialization within systems like the healthcare system. Um, for instance, uh, please don't read this quote, I'll read it aloud. Um, but, uh, so the doctor Sandeep Jauhar in a, new, a Newsweek article uh, presented this stunning tidbit here. I remember a 50-year-old patient of my Nigerian colleague who was admitted to the hospital with shortness of breath. During his month-long stay, which probably cost upward of $100,000, he was seen by a hematologist, an endocrinologist, a kidney specialist, a podiatrist, a two cardiologists, a, cardio, a cardiac electrophysiologist, an infectious disease specialist, a pulmonologist, an ear, nose, and throat specialist, a urologist, a gastroenterologist, a neurologist, a nutritionist, a general surgeon, a thoracic surgeon, and a pain specialist. The man underwent 12 procedures, including cardiac, cardiac catheterization, a pacemaker implant, plant and a bone marrow biopsy to investigate only mild anemia. Every day he was in the hospital, his insurance company probably got billed nearly $1,000 for doctor visits alone. When he was discharged with only minimal improvement in his shortness of breath, follow-up visits were scheduled for him with seven specialists. So what we have is, based on that principle of scientific reductionism in the field of science, we've seen that in, in societal systems that try to implement that science. So we have immense over-specialization, not just in medical fields, but fields in every realm of life that you could imagine. And so we don't just have doctors, we don't just have surgeons, we don't just have neurosurgeons, we don't just have neurosurgeons specializing in oncology, we don't just have neurosurgeons specializing in oncology, specializing in glioblastomas. Uh, we, we have all of those things, right? And so what happens is that in each specific niche, people get incredibly uh, competent and well-skilled and they're able to do their jobs, but only in that niche. And so we're able to treat things, but we don't consider the system anymore. And I bring up uh, an article by Atul Gawande who is writing about a patient of his who had stage four lung cancer and then developed metastases and then pneumonia in the hospital. And she had, again, all these different types of specialists looking after her. And the fact of the matter is that she probably only had a month to live. And each of these specialists was trying to treat an individual problem that they were probably able to treat. But as a system, she wasn't going to get any better. In fact, she was actually getting worse because of all of this. And so what happens then is that when you don't consider 
the, the effects of one detail in an overall system, you don't actually get improvement in the system as a whole. Again, going back to ecology, you know, there's this idea in ecology of wildlife management. And so in the California coastline, there is the, there's the kelp forest habitat, and you have otters, and you have sea urchins. And as uni, uh, sea urchin row has become popular in, you know, fancy restaurants, the sea urchin populations were decimated. And so the sea urchins um, were, were prey for the otters. And so then otter populations were, were reduced. And so then when you have a human influence on one component of a system, whether it's in an ecosystem or in the ecosystem of the body, you see one change can have enormous effects. So the idea is that perhaps, of course, continue continue reducing problems into their parts and trying to fix those parts, but also thinking about how those parts interact, having teams, having people understand what the system means as a whole. Thank you. <laughs>